Hello everyone. Hello. Hello everyone. Hope all of you are fine. Actually, tonight we will have a special. A webinar. This webinar will be concentrating on the, uh, the advantages of uh, guided bone generation in uh, implant technology today uh, and nowadays. Also, we will be hosting this uh, webinar for at least one and a half hours. All your questions are welcome. The professor for today was uh, was uh, ready to for this lecture, but due to some certain health problems, he will not be here. Actually, we will have our friend uh, Dr. Jim Torrey. 
he will start this lecture today. And this lecture will be hopefully all you are attending. Uh, any questions will be welcome through the questions bar. And then we can start now the gym. Just for knowledge, Dr. Jim Touré is uh, his specialty in modern implantology. He has been working at uh, Istanbul University for at least now four years, and he will be presenting today a nice presentation. I hope you will do fine, Dr. Jim. Hello. And we, good evening to everyone. Thank you for having me. I hope you can hear me. Yes, yeah, we can hear you very much. Okay. Let's start. Okay, so the subject of our webinar this evening is one regeneration strategies in modern oral implantology. We will be talking about uh, phone defects, how to fix these defects, and how to install implants later on, and some tips and tricks about prosthesis. Teamwork is, of course, essential. Uh, not everyone has the luxury of going into operations as a five-man army squad, but it certainly helps. Uh, I would like to say thanks to all my colleagues and friends from here. We will, of course, talk about, initially, uh, we will start with planning, evaluation of dental volumetric tomographies. So when do we need uh, dental volumetric tomographies. When do we need 3D radiographs? Well, primarily implants in the aesthetic region prior to uh, attempting treatment of peri-implantitis uh, cases, when we need to do immediate implantations and loading, and also in heart tissue augmentations to see what we have and see what we need and what we need to do to get there. It's especially important in the implants in the aesthetic region. As we all know, we need two millimeters of bone in the buccal side of the implant. And a, a volumetric tomography is an essential tool in this aspect to see the angulation of the implants, which angle we need to hold our tools, and whether we need to do a perhaps lateral augmentation to make sure we have the sufficient bone at the buccal side after implant placement. We have already said two millimeters of buccal bone is required if you want your aesthetics like this in the seventh year after implant placement. So how do we treat heart tissue defects? We have the first group as you can see on the left socket preservation, partial extraction, and immediate implantation. These are uh, mainly treatment alternatives, uh, which we can say if you catch the patient at the right moments uh, in the right time when we are basically taking out the tooth and we prefer one of these treatments, we will not have the heart tissue defects to treat to begin with. So it's in that aspect, it's sort of like an interceptive treatment. Then we have our sinus augmentations, lateral augmentations, and vertical augmentations, where we create bone where there isn't bone, or certainly where there isn't enough. So we need the right biomaterial in the right case and in the right treatments. So what are these uh, biomaterials of choice? We have a ladder here going from uh, less critical to, let's say, more difficult treatment options. And our needs in biomaterial shifts as we go up the steps of this, of this ladder. In the beginning, on the left, we have our socket preservation technique. For this, we can use a xenograft, mineralized allograft, demineralized allograft, calcium sulfates, Beta TCP, PRF, and we don't need autogenous bone, that's why there's a minus here, to 
do a socket preservation? Well, one thing we can also do a socket preservation is, as we all know, nothing. If you don't put any graft material after extracting the tooth, bone will heal, and then we can probably place an implant if not too much time has gone by. But if we do this socket preservation technique, the socket will be, let's say, as you left it. The buckle bone will be more intact, bone height, bone width will be more ideal for an implant, an implant placement. The next step is sinus augmentations. Again, because this is a basically a room with all bone walls and just one lateral window that we opened, which we can later close, we don't need autogenous bone to ensure uh, a healthy healing with xenografts, mineralized allografts, or hydroxyapatite-based grafts. We don't need autogenous bone to ensure uh, full healing in six months. The next steps are lateral and vertical augmentations and a combination of these uh, treatments. In these uh, treatment options, we do need autogenous bone. Uh, we need to mix autogenous bone to a, at a one-to-one -one ratio with xenografts. So equal parts autogenous bone and xenografts used in the same defects to ensure uh, that we have a nice bone, living bone, uh, that we can place an implant into later. The downside of this is, as we will discuss uh, in more detail later on, at the combination defects, if we have done both lateral and vertical augmentation, we need nine months of healing. So not six months like the sinus, uh, but eight or nine months at a minimum is a proper time for this to heal. But in the end, we will be rewarded with this. At here, you can almost see the before and after in the same picture. This is the before, the part where the radio opaque xenografts cannot be seen. And the full view is the after. And as we can see, there's a big difference in one of them. You can Basically, you can't place an implant in there in good conscience. You will not have enough bone. You will probably have no bone in the buckle side. And then in the after, with the, whole, the full bone we have here, it's very easy to place an implant comfortably. Another option that we have today, as I will now demonstrate, first in an animation and then a real life example, is a denting graft. In cases like the photo in the bottom left here, sometimes patients come and we say, okay, we need to uh, get rid of all these teeth. There's a widely effective periodontic infection. Uh, it has been aggressive. It has gone on for a long time. It has cost us bone, which we could have today if they were explanted before. But now that we have them, let's use them as a graft. Today, is, it's something we can say. After extracting them like this, we remove the tooths, enamel, and cements. We thoroughly dry the tooth. We place it in this machine, which comes with these kits. These kits are single use, or at least you can use them for uh, each patient. They can be used twice on the same patient. Uh, that can be done. We set the time for grinding, typically three seconds or five seconds for grinding, and then 20 seconds of sorting. The sorting means a vibration in the motor to filter the grafts, as we will see now. We say start. It's basically a blender with uh, blunt blades. The blades are not sharp. They just, they don't cut the teeth uh, they just hit it and crush it uh, very fast. There are two drawers here. The top one, which we can see now, has the usable graft in it. And the bottom layer catches uh, the pieces that are too small to be used in a graft, uh, which will go to waste. But a single tooth will produce 
maybe not three times as advertised, but twice its volume in uh, bone grafts, which we can use to preserve sockets or use in any kind of augmentation. And this graft is later processed with multiple solutions to clean it, and then we wash it with saline. And we can see it here in real life. We place the tooth in there, we start. It is extremely loud, a word of warning. You're going to use this for the first time. Mm -hmm. Then we say sort, there's a vibration. It filters the graft into three segments. Basically, I will pause here again. Parts that are too large to pass through the sieve will remain on top. The parts that can that we can use as a graft is caught in the first drawer, and the parts that are too small are in the bottom drawer, which will not be used. You can do this uh, a few times as needed. We have our grafts. We treat it with solutions, as we say. And then it's ready to be used as any other graph. The other two pictures here in the bottom right is a case we have done with this. All, all teeth, teeth basically were uh, explanted. Immediate implants were uh, placed. And then we have grafted both the uh, buccal sides of these implants. We always graft the gap, as we know, and every socket as well. And I can confidently say, after using all this graft material, we still had more than half, more than half of the uh, grafts that we initially acquired still unused. That certainly enlarges in volume as you turn it into a graft. Another autogenous material we can use is the PRF. Here we are seeing the aftermath of a uh, augmentation there, a double-sided augmentation. We take PRFs, as we know, like this, uh, from uh, centrifuging venous blood. We take this part, and then this is a tool we use. We play, place these PRFs here, and then we put a weighted plate on top of them to turn them into thin membranes. And we mainly use these after operations for soft tissue healing. They do not make the grafts heal faster. It will not cut your healing time from six months to three months or to five months from nine months. It will just make sure you have a better, healthier soft tissue faster. As we can see, we have put two layers of PRF on either side, and then we can either place sutures to lock them in place, or we can suture the flap back together, knowing the flap will also hold it in place. Another tool we can use is growth factors. Uh, we do not routinely use growth factors because uh, guess what also contains growth factors? The autogenous bone, uh, which we use in the one-to-one -one xenograft and autogenous bone, the autogenous bone already has enough uh, growth factors to promote healing. So socket preservation applications. As is demonstrated in the uh, simulation we have, this is what happens after a tooth extraction. A blood clot forms, it stabilizes, and then it turns into bone through healing. But through this healing, we use both height and width from the bone. We know only 15% of buccal bones thicker than one millimeter. This means after this part 
the bone supply from this part, which comes from the periodontologic periodontal ligaments, you take away half of the blood supply of a bone that's one millimeter thick. That bone will not survive for long, which we need, which is why we must either place an implant and graft, or we must place only a graft in the area and then close it for full healing. Here we have a case, a central tooth with external root resorption. We beforehand make a temporary fixed restoration, a Maryland, a Maryland bridge in uh, this case, which is an adhesive bridge which takes its support from the adjacent teeth from the palatal side. The support parts are invisible from the front anterior. So we prepare to extract. We go around the tooth for the blades to eliminate the gingival fibers. It is very important to extract with the forceps without moving the tooth buccally and lingually. If we do this movement too much, we will harm the buccal bone, which is already almost non-existent in this case, and that will be detrimental to the outcome of the treatment. After extraction, we go around with the curettes, make sure there's nothing, no soft tissue, granulation tissue left behind, and then we place our grafts. This can be a dentin graft, or a xenogenic graft, or aloe graft, the dentin graft, which you can uh, create from the tooth you have just extracted, for instance. And what I also want to emphasize is we need to use the right tool to compact and to really place the graft in the socket. We cannot use a very wide tool like a periodontal uh, elevator, but we need to use something like an uh, amalgam condenser like uh, we are using here. You really need to be able to compact the, two, the graft towards the apex. And then we place our collagen membrane. This is a nylon suture. We will talk about this suturing towards the end as well. Three sutures to the buccal side, three sutures to the palatal, palatal side. And then we are done. Instead of a collagen membrane, you can also use a collagen sponge. You can compact it with sterile gloves, cut it into a circle, place it in, in its place, and then suture uh, from the gingiva to the collagen sponge, which works just as well. We are preparing the site for the temporary prosthesis, the temporary bridge we have prepared beforehand on our cast model. And then it is bonded in place. If you have a color of composite you don't like, and it's always left over, this is your chance to get rid of that composite resin. Next up, we have our post-op picture. This place was further refined afterwards. We must make sure there is disclusion or uh, non-occlusion in this uh, temporary prosthesis. We check for protrusive and lateral movements in the jaw and make sure that in none of these movements there is any contact between the bridge and the lower teeth. And if there is any contacts, we remove those contacts with a turbine. And this is our end result. Four months later, we are ready to place an implant in that region. And we can see just how much bone volume, how much bone width we have here.
what kind of implants should we use in the area that we have augmented? It's something that needs to be talked about as well. Well, for one thing, we want bone level implants. No tissue level implants with large machine surfaces, but rather bone level implants with minimal, if any, machine surfaces. We prefer a conical design, not cylindrical implants, and a threaded design, of course, but a little more on the aggressive side can be preferable to make sure we have our primary stability uh, in the augmented bone, which is sometimes described as in the sinus area as a D5 bone. So to ensure we have enough uh, primary stability, we need a little bit on the aggressive side uh, of screws. Also, another thing we should warn about is something we do uh, to ensure primary stability in the regular bone is sometimes under preparation, which is not using the final drill or not fully using the final dr drill, not going all the way with it. Uh, if you do, if you take this route in an augmented bone, you have a very real chance of cracking the bone you have augmented or separating the bone you have augmented from the native bone in the area. So we must use the final burr, but uh, we should refrain from under preparations in the augmented bone. One more thing to increase primary stability is the osseodensification protocol. This is basically a set of burrs we use in reverse mode, counterclockwise. And what this does is, as shown in the video, not as dramatically as this, but instead of cutting to remove the bone for our osteotomy, it pushes the bone to the walls and making sure you have a more uh, a tougher wall for the osteotomy. You can see it's being used in a case here as well. This is the burr we are using. It is recommended to use it in a pecking motion, as with all burrs, but it's especially advised to not stay still, just pushing for long, but do a pecking motion with the burr. They can be used with a wide uh, array of different brands of implants. They have multiple diameters, and instead of uh, certain Instead of being used with stoppers, they have lines, multiple lines, with, to ensure you can use it with pretty much any implant design. The burr you're seeing here is being used in reverse. I should stress this, it's usually forgotten. I will fast forward a bit. This is especially something to watch for. Also, we can see it here in the video. How the ball almost seem to, seems to radiate out of there. It has a crater shape, as they call it. And then we are placing our implant. In this case, we have also used an OSTEL device to measure the ISQ of the implants. We have which we will see in a second. Here we are measuring. And we have a score of 82 ISQ in the posterior mandible, mind you, where uh, the bone is the softest in the mouth, as they say, D4 bone. So it's something worth a try if you like the idea. So. Another option is splitting or enlarging a ridge. The same burrs, the Versailles burrs. Another application of these burrs is also to widen a ridge. The effect is not as dramatical as we will see here, but if you have a critical amount of, amount of bone on a ridge and it's just on the border of 
Maybe we should augment. Maybe we should not augment. I'm not sure. We don't really need to augment. So let's perhaps try this. So that instead of maybe having left one meter on the buckle side, we will have one and a half or two meters. Rich, ex rich expansion. If you're going to split rich surgically, as we know, we need at least four millimeters to make a sandwich. Two millimeters one side, two millimeters on the other side. Here we are seeing it on a case, also on the photos here. We are creating a section with a microsaw, splitting the ridge, placing the oste osteotomies with the Versa first again, and then placing implants, grafting the midsection, grafting the buccal end peltal, and then covering it with a collagen, mem collagen membrane. Now for sucks preservation applications, as we see again, buccal bone, as we stressed it, is very important. Another very important thing in the aesthetic area, we will talk about it again, but I will say it here first. Implant diameter is very important. We never, and I stress this, never use implants with a diameter of four or more in the aesthetic region. We can use 3.0 millimeter as 3.0, 3.3, 3.5, 3.8, whatever your implant system you are using supports, you should use that implant with a smaller diameter than four millimeters. We could probably confidently say we could place an implant of five or six millimeters here. We have enough bone to do that, but that's the older way of thinking. Implants, the better. What's the best implant you can put somewhere? The biggest one you can. Now we think. The more healthy bone around the implant we place, healthier it is for the patient in the long term. Now we will talk about immediate implantation and about grafting the buccal space. Either it's better for an old place. For this, both are fine. We mainly tend to preserve xenografts as they we see as permanent. We take our mental volumetric tomography to see what we are doing. Something that will support us with this is a thick buccal bone is always good to have. A low smile line with will make any uh, mistakes we make invisible. See if I'm sharing properly. Okay, now I'm sharing it. Like we said, we take our dental volumetric tomography. A thick buccal bone is good to have. A low smile line will hide if we have any mistakes in the midsection. And the thick gingiva also does the same. With risky defects, we can wait uh, six to nine weeks as a socket preservation, or we can just graft the whole defect. And then preferably, if we have a defect like this, we can place a membrane over the grafted place here as well uh, to graft the defect and make it heal better, ensure it heals better. Now we have a video here. Which we can see what we are doing, in which we can see what we are doing. We extract the teeth, like we said, with minimal trauma. Like we saw here, not this motion from buccal to lingual, but a rotating motion is healthier when extracting the incisors or premolars. This is another essential thing, as we know. We prepare our osteotomy on the palatal wall. We begin with an angle like this on the palatal wall. And after we go through the palatal wall, we go like this.
first with a right angle on the bone, and then we shift our angle upwards, as we can see here. The osteotomy is prepared. This is what we want to see. The osteotomy is on the pelvic wall, not in the apex, certainly not on the buccal wall, but on the pelvic wall. I also have to stress the going with the right angle in the beginning is important to make this indentation here to begin with. If you don't do that, if you just try to go fully let the socket lead you in a way, you will end up drilling the apex, and we don't want that. Then we place our implants. It's a good idea to support it with your thumb, the driver, because otherwise, once again, like we said, the socket can lead you the way and you will end up at the apex. We place our implants the same way. We mix. This is something that can be applied for any graft you use. We mix whatever graft we use with metronidazole, be it so single uh, xenograft or a mixture of xenografts and potagon spawn. We mix it with uh, an antibiotic solution to ensure we have no infections later on. We mainly do a socket preservation in the central tooth, and we graft a buckle gap on the immediate implantations. As you can see, one reason we didn't do the implants here is they have just zero buckle bone. Also, laterals are preferable to central incisor area. And once again, the tool we use to graph the buckle gap is even more important. This is a very tiny place and a very deep place. We are basically reaching all the way to the apex here. So if you just try to place the graph with a periodontal elevator, uh, you won't get far, literally, with the graft. Instead, what you can use is a very thin tool like this like the one you use to shape a uh, composite resin, for example, for fillings, or uh, another filling tool, which is the excavator, which is essentially a very tiny curette, but with a hemispheric section, which is the same shape the section we have here. So you can use those tools to compact the bone after immediate implantation. We leave the top parts of the implants two millimeters below the below the bone, below the bone height. We cover it with some xenograft in the end, just to make sure to be, to be safe. And to close the defect, there we are basically doing a mini lateral augmentation here. Without a shot in spawn, of course. We just want to contour the bone in that area and to close the, close the defect. We are using pins to stabilize and immobilize the graft and the membrane, which is essential for healing of the graft. We remove the excess. We use another collagen membrane for the other side, close that defect, again, pinning it in place, grafting, pinning the other side, and then placing healing allotments. Make sure we don't lose them.
And then we are doing something I will talk about again later on in the augmentation section, but we have a very good view of it here. This is a releasing incision. This is something we have to do every time whenever we are altering the contour of the bone from the buccal side or from a height perspective. We will simply otherwise not be able to make the ends of the tap meet properly if we don't do this. What we are doing is we are placing an incision at the base of the graft of the flap, sorry, not in the middle here, not around the flap edge, but at the very base. And then after we place the incision all the way, we must do what is called a brushing stroke to release the flap. This is a special tool built to do this, but as you can see, we switch to a simpler tool. You can use an elevator, horizontal elevator, for this. At some point, you will realize, like here, there's a string-like structure that prevents the gingiva, the flap, from releasing. And whenever you set it, see that, what you have to do is go there again with the blade, checking with the back of the blade where it is, and then with the sharp edge, a small incision there, just on that string that's preventing you from releasing with the graft. And when you do that, you will see that side releasing as well. Did you catch that? Watch here again. As soon as we make the incision, the whole flap just relaxes towards us. Right here. Boom. And now we can safely close that. We go again, checking in the middle. How much do we have? How much do we have? Just enough is good. And this is what we want to see in the end. You should be able to pull the whole flap all the way to the midsection so that you can make the ends of the flap meet without tension is the key. Okay. You could argue you could, uh, not all of this, but some of this, if you have not done it enough, let's say, you could just put extra tense uh, sutures in there, but that's not good for the healing. And those sutures can uh, rupture the flap, and then the flap will open them in anyway. And then we will have an infection. Like we said, this is what we want to see. This is not magic, of course. What we are doing here is basically uh, borrowing it from the sulcus, which we can later be mod modified, but we usually don't need to modify it with uh, a big uh, gingival graft later on. Yes, the reason we use the xenograft in most of my cases in this presentation is because xenografts are basically forever, like they say about diamonds. When you successfully place a xenograft in a patient and it heals in a socket or on an augmentation, you can rest easy knowing the patient will carry that xenograft for the rest of his or her life. It will not resort, it will not go anywhere. It will stay the way you put it in the way, in the place you have put it. So they are very, very stable in that regard. So for immediate implantations and also immediate loadings, what do we need? We need more than 35 Newton centimeters of insertion torque. Or if you're checking with an Ostel device, an ISQ value of over 65. If you have, if we have these, then we can immediately implant, immediate implant, immediately implanted uh, posts. Uh, the immediate loading prosthesis should be a single piece. It must be immobile, 
it must not press also on the healing graft underneath it. And we have to use a monofilament suture, especially important when we are uh, doing this, uh, just so uh, it does not retain any food or bacteria during the healing time. Basically, we will talk now about socket shields. What we are saying is we want to make sure that the tooth goes away, but the bone stays. Well, how do we do that? If we extract the bone, like we said, we are taking away half of the blood supply of this thin piece of bone from the periodontal ligament. Well, we remove the rest of the bone, the rest of the tooth, but we keep a part of the buccal, buccal tooth in the socket. This is called a partial extraction or a socket shield. We create a C-shape of the buccal tooth. We remove the rest. We make sure the part we leave in is immobile. The tooth does not have any periodontal damage or periodontal infection in the beginning. We make sure there's place for our prosthesis. We make sure the apex of the tooth is uh, the, in the part we have removed. And once again, we gap uh, we fill the gap with xenograft, the gap between the implant we have placed in the palatal side and the partial tooth we have left in the buccal side. After we remove the excess of the tooth, just like our regular extraction, we are going around the tooth, removing fibers, we make our osteotomy in the pelvis. We further shape the tooth so that it looks like this uh, diagram we have to the right of the video here. We need a round bird to create this part here. And then we finish the osteotomy. Wash the area. Place our implants on the pelvic side. And then we graph the gap. This is also a good tool for this area. It does not have an area of effect. It's uh, basically a sharp turret, but the area we are trying to fill is also in that shape. So we can use that. We are closing the area, suturing. This is a PTFP suture. Very preferable if you have it. The same idea, the same principles for uh, the area where we are applying the partial extraction. Bone level intense, conical design with threads on the aggressive side. So prefer these types of intents not these with machine surfaces or cylindrical designs. Yes, temporary restorations in the aesthetic region. The curvature, the preserved buckle bone can be seen here. There is no indentation, there's no resorption of the buckle bone. So we have the same outline when we are looking from the occlusal side. And something to watch for is because the prosthesis is also on the, on the palatal side, the entryway of the prosthesis is also on the palatal side of the socket. And we craft an emergency emergence profile in the aesthetic region for a minimal bone resorption. Here we can see the production of the prosthesis transferring it with using a silicone mold. And this is our end result. So before talking about bone augmentation, let's talk about preparation. All dental treatments before and uh, dental treatments must be completed beforehand. We 
don't want to go into an augmentation with a uh, very thick level of calculus in the lower anterior mandible. We don't want caries. We don't want an endodontic or periodontal infection next to the area we are treating because these uh, types of infections within the in the mouth can transfer from one side to the other, endangering what we are doing at the augmentation area. We prepare our biomaterial. We prepare our irrigation. Plenty of irrigation will be needed. We clean the patient's face uh, with an iodine solution, which is especially important uh, with male patients with facial hair. You can remember at times when we are placing sutures, the suture, uh, the excess of the suture goes around this area. And then when we pull on the suture, it just grazes this area. And then what you have on here, there, will basically be transferred on the Place you are placing the suture. So if you clean that area, we don't need to worry about that happening. And we need a one minute mouthwash uh, rinse with the Corexidin solution. And what about, what about medical treatment? What do we prescribe to the patients after a, or an augmentation? Basically, we have antibiotics. Two antibiotics in uh, combination. One gram of amoxicillin twice a day for 10 days, starting preferably one or two days before the op operation so that the blood level of the antibiotic is already elevated when you are placing your first incision. If the pay or azithromycin can be uh, placed in, pla in place of amoxicillin, and metronidazole of 500 milligrams three times a day for seven days. This is important, especially to stress to the patients. Sometimes they will say, oh, doctor, I prefer not to take too much medicine. And then when the patients come back with infection or pain or another undesired outcome, you say, well, have you, you ha have you used the antibiotic? And the patient will say, oh, I did not have any pain or anything after two days, so I stopped using it. No, we say. Pain or not, swelling or not, bruises on the face or not. In every case, you use the antibiotics till you run out of antibiotics. It's important to stress this. For analgesic, we can prefer ibuprofen of uh, 100 milligrams uh, twice a day or to a maximum on maybe the first day, three times a day is enough, but usually not necessary. We start this right after the operation, or as I tell the patients, either bring it with you, or when you take it from the pharmacy, right then and there, take one analgesic tablet so that before our uh, before the injection we make, uh, before the anesthesia wears out, the analgesic comes into play, and you have no pain throughout the process. We also prescribe a mouthwash, the same Clorexidine mouthwash the patient has used for two weeks, starting one or two days after the operation, basically because we don't want the patient to rinse or use a mouthwash right at, on the day or the next day after the operation, because it can promote bleeding. It can prevent bleeding from stopping. If the patient keeps washing his or her mouth and then spitting, it will uh, be detrimental to Stopping the, stopping the bleeding. And the gengel mouthwash can also be used for any other brand you have with uh, the active ingredient hyaluronin, starting also one or two days after the operation. This is basically for uh, improving soft tissue healing. And finally, our latest addition, also very, very important, is a local corticosteroid injection. In schools, sometimes they teach us corticosteroids are dangerous because they uh, prevent in the immune function from 
functioning in the area, but uh, it's essential after augmentations because when you use a local corticosteroid injection right after you are done with the sutures, the swelling will be significantly reduced. This is both for the patient's comfort and confidence. They will ask you, patients, uh, uh, doctor, will I be, how, for how many days can't I work after this operation? When we are doing this, we say you can work the next day or right after here if you need to, because it reduces, as, I, as we have list, listed, it reduces soft tissue inflammation, pain and swelling, tension in the sutures, which, which is also very important. We want non-tense non sutures in the first place, but uh, when we make sure we have done a proper injection of corticosteroids, there will be no swelling to increase that tension in those sutures we have placed. When uh, you prefer in a sinus scenario, sinus lift scenario, reduces inflammation of the sinus mucosa, reduces the thickness of the sinus mucosa, and prevent, prevents the blockage of the sinus osteum by this mucosa we have lifted. We may, we do one of the local corticosteroid injections ourselves, much like anesthesia in the same way, we distribute it to multiple points. And then two days afterwards, we tell the patients, you can have the injection to the gluteal muscle, in an emergency room of any hospital that's, that is close to you, or uh, your local doctor, URC, can do this for you. Okay, so now we can talk about lateral and vertical augmentations. We know we have multiple options for this. We can do an autogenous bone block, to augment, augment the bone, we can use guided bone regeneration. We can use the Curie technique, or we can use an allograft block. We will mainly be focusing on guided bone regeneration, not because I'm lazy, but because we have tried, as you can see, all of these, and the best results by far we have had with these was from guided bone regeneration, which means it is foreseeable, it's predictable, which is a very positive. Uh, quality you want in a treatment choice. So let's stop these in the beginning. We have two choices in membranes. We can use a collagen membrane. Collagen membranes can be cross-linked or non-cross-linked. More on that later. Or we can use a DPTFE membrane, which is a Teflon membrane. If these are titanium reinforced, like we can see here on the right, they will be abbreviated as PTFE-TR, titanium reinforced, or to the same effect, we can use a pure titanium mesh as well. The collagen membrane is easy to manipulate. It is uh, our choice of membrane, as long as it's safe to choose it, basically, especially in lateral augmentations, horizontal augmentations. It's easy to use, low risk, it better tolerates exposition and it has a lower chance of exposition because it's more, more uh, biocompatible. It's shortcoming and where the DPTFP membrane comes in is bearing loads and augmenting the bone at a vertical point, which we will talk about later. Because the titanium reinforcements especially means it can bear, take some load on it and still keep the graft immobile, which is the most important thing to uh, ensure we are doing in augmentations. If the graft moves a few microns every day or, or a millimeter every day, you will not get any healing in that part of the graft. As we can see here, the sole shortcoming of the collagen membrane is this depression that occurs when the area takes load afterwards and we can follow lateral augmentation with a case this patient was referred to us from orthodontics the patient is congenitally missing her lateral incisors from birth the place has been set 
they are telling us we will remove the braces whenever you are ready to place the implants. So we send the patient to a uh, to take a tomography, and lo and behold, we see the bone height is optimal, but there is no bone thickness to speak of. It's a very sharp edge of a bone. It's impossible to place implants, but the bone height is good, so we decide to go for a lateral augmentation in both areas. I will be talking over this video. This, what we are using here, is a bone scraper called a safe scraper. It's a single use uh, device to collect bone from an area. The donor site, which we have chosen here, is the lower posterior mandible. This is a separate incision in that area, just so we can. Uh, collect some shavings of bone from that area to mix with xenografts later. We take some venous blood, make some Garrett membranes for soft tissue healing. We press on them with the weighted plate, like we mentioned. Create the membranes. We mix the bone, we have shades with hardened bone. Our membranes are ready. We place one of the membranes in the donor sites, promote healing in that area. This is not essential. You can skip placing a PRF, but it helps with the soft tissue in the area. Now we place our initial incisions. We raise the flap. We are raising the flap, but something I want to show you here is where we place our vertical incisions. We are operating on this part. You always want to go either one or two feet behind the area to widen your area of operation for ease of operation. This is important. We are lifting, elevating the flap, making sure there's no soft tissue in the area. You can see how thin the bone is in the area. We are decorticating the bone, which is mainly making sure we have tunnels from the native bone going to the graft for the angiogenesis to happen to ensure the graft has a blood supply to heal. Here comes our membrane. We place one pin on the palatal side just so the membrane can stay there and is ready for us to fold it over the graft after we place it. You can see we have shapes and cut lines here to fit the teeth so that we don't have an excess of membrane pressing along the teeth. We are placing our graft in. You can see the mixture of pathogen spawn and xenografts. We are depositing the graft in the area watching the contour around the area we want to match or exceed the contour of the neighboring area now we will fold the membrane that was hanging from here over the graft we have placed and now we are placing pins to immobilize the graft and the membrane It is essential to use sufficient, a sufficient number of pins. As we can see, we have placed pins here to close this area. We have left, left this area open and this area open. To do this trick you will see now. Leave the only, lift the only open parts of the membrane. 
paste some graphs in there. You can see how tense it is here. We want it uh, to be very hot in the area. Once you press it with your finger, it should not move at all from the buckle side. You can check with your finger later on. But for it to be taut and tense, you do this. You place a bit of graft in the open area, and then you stretch the collagen membrane over the graft. Let's do that quickly one more time. Stretching it over the part you have grafted, holding that part, and then placing a pen right there. When you press with your finger here, there will be no movement there. Now, we do the same thing on the other side and place our remaining PRFs on top of the area, on top of the collagen membranes, and then finish. Look at it after six months, and this is what we see. The homography slices we have seen in the beginning, going in every direction. What do we do about these pins? Basically nothing. You can just leave them if you don't want to lift the flap in the implant uh, when placing the implant it depends if you don't want to raise the flap all the way which you don't need to you can leave them there they are titanium and sterile they will not cause you any problems later on and now we are going into retrieve the area and place implants we will be using your certification protocol as well Here's our incision, vertical incisions, flap elevation. You will always find some loose graft particles, no matter how careful you are. It's not a, a negative, th negative thing about the treatments. They cause no harm. We go on and elevate the flap. We are doing our osteotomy in order to place the implants. We are checking for our angle. Using another, another drill. Also densification protocol working in reverse, placing our implants. Implants in place. And we check the contour of the buckle side and think there is a bit lacking on the buckle side. So what we will do is we will create a pedicle connective tissue graft from the pellets in the same area. We are making an incision. We are elevating the area. We are making a partial thickness flap, or as I like to call it, cut a fillet of connective tissue from there, except for the pedicle which connects it on the mesial side, which we will need for its blood supply. We are going slowly, making sure not for the blade to not come out from the pellets. It's very hard to suture close once that's done, not impossible. And then we take our connective tissue with the pedicle here and fold it over to the buckle side, as we will see now. We take it, fold it over the implants, over to the buckle side for more thickness in the area. This is mainly an aesthetic concern, mind you. It's not essential. Using your resorbable Micro suture to lock it in place, once towards the apical parts and once around this two here, the canine, to make sure it covers the whole area. Once there, and like we said, once around the canine. And our connective tissue graft is in place and will supply us with the desired thickness in the buckle area. It's the same story here. 
basically fast forwarding incision left elevation osteotomy checking the angle placing the implants we have the buckle bone but we want more thickness going to the pellets incision left elevation of the pellets cutting the pedicle graft suturing to the buckle side Making, making sure we have enough flat. As I recall, we did not need a releasing incision in this area. And then closing the area. This is what we end up with. In the aesthetic region, we can use the connective tissue to help create a good emergence profile and a good buckle profile for the aesthetics. So we have talked about what kinds of kind of implants uh, we use. We are continue, continuing up on that. We want threaded implants, we want bone level implants, but we want them based one millimeter or so subcrestally below the bone level, in especially in the aesthetic region, to not not to, in order to not, not compromise from the aesthetics, we have two millimeters or bone or of bone or more. We place it palatally and we do not use, once again, a diameter more than four millimeters, 3.3, 3.5, whatever your implant uh, system supports. Platform switching implants, if, if we uh, have them, can be used in augmented areas for the, to preserve the bone level. And a connective tissue uh, graft, as we talked about, uh, to augment the buckle soft tissue as well. Screw retained temporary pro prosthesis in place, two months of shaping the gingiva, and our final results. Now, the right tools for the right job for vertical augmentations. Like we said, we are using PTFE membranes here. PTFE TR, titanium reinforced, like we see here. We need our tempting screws. Uh, you have seen these in a part of the video, one of the videos before. These are the, as they are called, tenting screws. They are the main holes of the tents we are about to make. They are the ceiling of the tents, and they will limit the minimum amount of bone we will end up with in the area. So they are basically bumpers for the PTFE membrane. Also stabilization screws or pins to make sure we immobilize the graft sufficiently and the autogenous bone that we will collect from the patient. I have another uh, releasing incision and brushing motion video here. Let's go over this quickly. Like we mentioned, we can't close this area. For instance, this is a, like you can see, one immediate implantation and one partial extraction. But the same idea is valid here. We need the area to close, doesn't close, so we create more flap. We make an incision on the base of the flap, all the way, the whole flap. Superficial one at first, and then brushing. And for the areas that don't want to relax, around two with a blade, just for those, like we mentioned, just those strings need to be incised, and then we can close it easily. We check along the way, do we have enough? No, a little more. Check enough, do we have enough? No, a little more, until we have enough flap to easily close the area tension-free. A little word about suturing. We leave the sutures for three weeks. That's one thing. We see the patient every week, one week after, two weeks after, to say, okay, it looks good, you are healing well. And then at the third week, we are 
removing the sutures, but until then the sutures stay in place. Uh, we use monofilament sutures. You, our choices for this best bets are uh, nylon, the one you see here. That's go, that goes by the trade name Ceralon. And uh, the other one is Teflon sutures, the white sutures you can come across on textbooks, especially on augmentation uh, subjects. Uh, those are PTFP sutures, Teflon sutures. Both are pr uh, preferable over silk or vicryl. We definitely don't want resorbable vicryl, but silk also tends to collect food and thus bacteria. We don't want that to prevent infection. So monofilament sutures whenever you can. And the other point is, as we know, basic sutures just connect two dots. We need to close an area in uh, augmentations, like we have after we release we release the flap. So in the beginning, you have to place horizontal mattress sutures. These are the ones in question here: one, two, three, four, five. And you can see the difference between the entry or their entry points. Basic sutures are basically right next to two, three millimeters from the flap. The incision line. We want the horizontal mattress sutures to carry weight. They are weight bearing sutures. So we want them preferably five millimeters away from the incision line to for them to carry load. This uh, horizontal mattress goes from here to here, this line you can see here. And after you place four, uh, five or seven starting from the middle, uh, horizontal mattress sutures, you will see basically all you, that's left for you to do is to just connect the flaps over this area. This is what you want to create with the horizontal mattress sutures here, five millimeters from here and five millimeters here, here from here. You will end up with this. And then all you need to do with basic sutures is just to make sure the tops of them don't move. That is essential, especially since in the, the augmentation procedure, understandably, you will be tired, but it's important to not rush the suture and make sure you have a tension-free closure in the end. This is a vertical augmentation case. We started with these comically large and aggressive vertical defects. This is the cross section of the bone photo of the defects. And this is the after tomography. Like you can see, all defects are filled, and we have uh, 15, 16 millimeters of bone in every area. This is a waiting period of nine months. That is essential. It's essential to talk about this with the patient in the beginning also. Here we see the recovery video. We open the area. We are faced with the membranes since they are not resorbable. They are there for a whole nine months with us, with the patient. We lift the flap, remove the screws and pins. You need to remove the screws, but the pins you can more or less uh, gently pull on the membrane to remove. You don't need to, if you have placed the pins on a very extreme edge, you don't need to elevate all the way. In the end, they look very pale, very white, but they quickly adjust as bone flows better to the area after we remove the tense membranes. Now, we don't have the video here, but the reason we did this with the back of the mirror is to is for the video to show the sound the back of the mirror makes when we put it on the bone. It sounds like a wall. It may look like wet sugar or wet sand, but it's very tough after nine months. It's like a solid wall of D1 bone, I would say. Uh, very, it's, it has the same 
resistance to osteotomy as a healthy D1, D2 bone. So we are rewarded for our patients in the end. We placed four implants and then a bar prosthesis on top of the implants here. This is the prosthesis and the end results. And this is a local vertical augmentation. The patients came to us with deficient bones, an extracted central uh, periapical lesion, which we can see the extent of here, and basically no buccal bone in front of the tooth, and very little bone width in the number 21 area. So we decided to make a... Let me mute the video. Okay. We decided to make a combination augmentation. We are placing our tentative screws. These are basically our, let's say, internal frame of the construction. And then we will make our wall, outer wall of the building. We put our graft, we lay our graft on equal parts, xenografts and autografts. Once we are happy with the bone shape, and we have to be happy, mind you, with the bone shape because uh, the PTFE membrane cannot be stretched over the parts we have missed. So you want to first roughly shape your bone graft in the area and then fold it over, screw and pin both in the corners and in midsections of the angles to hold it in place. After five months of healing, this is what we saw. The healing was uneventful, no, in, no infections, but at the fifth month, we were thinking, hmm, we are kind of at the 21 area. We are kind of seeing the shadow of the membrane. And on the seventh month, we could fully see the membrane. At seven months, uh, we have membrane exposition, but no need to stress because the bone is already matured enough at this stage to hold its own, to be, it's able to stand up on its own. It doesn't need its outer shell anymore. So knowing this, we went to remove the uh, membrane and then let the soft tissue heal on its own. If you see this for the first time, and if you have not listened to this webinar, you might be tempted to go just, oh, I will just put a suture in one end and on, on the other, and I will close it. Any attempt to make to close this uh, exposition will just make it bigger and wider. A word of warning. So, placed our incisions, removed the membrane. The bone can be seen here. Plenty of width, more than enough face implants. And then we left two months of soft tissue healing time with PRFs inside to help with the soft tissue healing. At nine months, we opened up back up. Uh, over a stent, we have placed our implants. We can see the video here. We go in, place our plastic stents, place our implants. We decided to graph the contour after looking at this area. We found it deficient. Uh, we found it deficient in this area, so we decided to grab the contour so that we had a better line on the buccal side. For this, we just needed a collagen membrane because we are augmenting laterally. Our pins in place, it's our membrane is taut. And then we have closed. This is the 10th day post-operation. Look at this beautiful buckle bone. 
on both sides, both implants. Six months after healing, after uh, loading the implants, six months, so 15 months total, our bone is in place, right where we put it, right where we need it. This is the end result. And this beautiful contour here is the result of our secondary lateral augmentation. So we can augment the bone, but does it really stay that way? Does it stay the way we want it, the way we have created it? Uh, we have done two studies on this subject in our department. One of them is as follows. We have compared a GBR augmentation, horizontal and vertical, using xenograft and hydrogen spawn, six to nine months of healing, two, an iliac bone block, no biomaterial, and three months of healing. And to clarify, we are not trying to cheat with our GBR six to nine months of healing and giving the block just three months. It is a known fact that if, uh, you probably know this. After three months, the iliac block is already melting in place. It's resorbing fast. So before it's all gone, you need to place your implants and load that bone uh, to cut the bleeding, cut the resorption of the bone. So after the healing periods, after the longer healing period, the GBR bone was resorbed at a percentage of 12%. And just after three months, the iliac block has disappeared by 35%. And at the last follow-up of 30 months, the GBR is uh, staying stable at just 15 percent of bone resorption, and the iliac block is at 41%. And as you can see by the standard deviation numbers, it's also less predictable how much more uh, you will be losing with the iliac block. We have also made a comparison to intraoral blocks, and basically because of the bone's quality and composition, intraoral, blo intraoral blocks uh, resorb even less especially when they are um, combined with xenografts on top and around and the membrane. That's also a large part of the uh, success. But with the GBR, we don't have the donor area morbidity. Uh, it's, all, it's both uh, worrying for the patients to say, we will, block a, we will remove a block of bone from your jaw and put it to another part and just say, OK, we will now, in the beginning, make an incision in this area, and then we will shave a bit of bone to mix with our uh, bone dust, as we say in Turkish, at least. And then uh, it will be placed on the receiving side. The patient is much more uh, accept accepting of the uh, uh, bone shaving collection with the GBR, the bone scraper idea. Again, temporary prosthesis is necessary after augmentation. We need a fixed, fixed prosthesis. If this is a single tooth area, like uh, in the last part, we can do a two tooth Maryland bridge or an Essex plastic. But if we are, uh, as we are usually doing uh, full mouth restoration and augmentation, we need four implants per arch, be it maxilla or mandible. Okay, I am to finish, so I will fast forward a little. In cases like this, uh, when we need to remove every tooth and place immediate implants, it's much better to say to the patients, okay, uh, when they ask doctor, uh, okay, you will extract every teeth and I will receive implants, but when can I use these implants? And we will say uh, four to six months, probably four months. And the patient will say, what will I do for the four months? You can either say, you should have thought of that before having chocolate for dinner and not brushing it afterwards. It's better to say, oh, don't worry, we will give you four temporary implants. And then on top of those, we will load them with a full arch prosthesis. And you will go without tooth only one or two days. The patient is much more accepting and more comfortable with that idea. This is what we have done here. Dentin grafting for temporary implants. Cerulon nylon sutures for less food retention and a temporary prosthesis 
in place over the temporary implants. Finally, we will talk about sinus lifting, and I will mainly be talking about the complication of membrane perforation. We all know how sinuses go. I don't need to explain to you. We open a lateral window, we lift the membrane, grab the sinus, close the membrane, success. The problem you will have most frequently will be uh, cysts, cystic infections of the sinus and membrane perforations. So what do we do about them? It's also about anatomy. If this angle is too acute, it's very difficult to uh, lift the membrane of a such acute angle. It's easier if the angle is wider. This is something we can see on the uh, tomographies. With the drill, uh, the risk has been found to be between uh, 11 and 15 percent in perforations. If you have a piezo surgery tool, will re greatly reduce the, reduce this risk because piezo surgery tools don't damage non-hard tissues such as membranes. Uh, author ha authors have said uh, perforations negatively implant the success, or they have also reported it has no effect on implant success placed in uh, sinus sinuses if there's a perforation. Risk factors contain membrane thickness and uh, the membrane can be so thick you would have to push to uh, perforate it, or it can be so thin like a mucus layer that it will disappear before your eyes as you are, you are trying to lift it and it just resorbs all uh, its entirety during the operation. And, and then another complication factor is the underwood septa, which can turn one sinus into two sinuses in extreme cases like this, or it can be a bump uh, in the floor of the sinus which you have to follow over. We have, as we mentioned, two collagen membrane, two collagen membrane types, cross-linked and non-cross-linked. Cross-linked membranes uh, are of somewhat lower biocompatibility. They resorb a bit later, and they are a bit uh, difficult to use a little bit, but non-cross-linked membranes are on the negative side. They resorb a, bit, a little bit earlier, but they are very biocompatible to expositions. They are good in cases of expositions. And tip and trick here is to only wet cross-linked uh, collagen membranes before the operation. If you wet non-cross-linked uh, native collagen membranes, uh, in other words, before the operation, they will just stick on their own and be much harder to uh, use in the operation. The lateral window should be placed a millimeter away from the walls, the reason being the, the place where the perforation is is very important to its repair. If it's in the middle, like on the top picture here, it's uh, basically a case of lifting the whole membrane and then simply placing a layer of collagen membrane on the ceiling. It will stick on its own and then grab uh, as we like it. If it's large or just at the edge of the medial wall and you cannot open the window, for instance, if our in uh, the whole we, the perforation we have created was here and the medial wall was here, we couldn't have enlarged the window to make the perforation get in the middle of the window. So it's for that reason it's important to place the window two millimeter away from the walls to have the safety uh, margin. If the perforation is larger or on the edge, we use pins and membranes, as I will show you in the final part of our presentation. Uh, forgive me, everyone, for uh, being late, but I'm going uh, faster now. OK, this part is a little important. When you see the perforation like this, you have a few options. You can as we mentioned, lift the collagen membrane, lift the uh, Schneiderian membrane, place a collagen membrane on top of the perforation, and then go on with your business as usual. You can place a PRF membrane on top. You can use a fibrin glue to make the ends meet and glue the pieces together. Or what I should, uh, something I should especially warn you against is sutures. 
when you see something like this for the first time, you can say, oh, I will. Uh, I have read in a book they can be sutured together. I have a very thin reservable uh, suture, so I will just suture this like any other uh, incision. This will not work mainly for uh, two reasons. One, if the membrane was of sufficient thickness, you wouldn't have perforated it in the beginning. If you have perforated it, it's thin. And if it's thin, second reason, if you go around it with a suture, one on the top and one on the back, before you can even tighten that knot, you will now have two perforations and bigger perforations, and you will find yourself thinking, oh, I, now I need two collagen membranes instead of one. So that's why I would advise against sutures. You can use the other options, but we prefer the collagen membrane because it's the most, uh, the one that makes us feel most safe and the one we have the most success with. Like we said, make the perforation visible and try to get it in the middle of your window. If not possible, uh, lift the membrane and create a new compartment and close the entry to the compartment with the large perforation. Another thing, as we mentioned it before, I return to perforations is cysts. The main idea with cysts is we will make our own per we will make our own perforation with an injector. Uh, larger injector if we can we go in and aspirate the contents of the cyst to the injector and then we will no longer be pressing on a water balloon with the cysts pushing back but because we have aspirated it we can now easily lift uh, the membrane you can see the valsalva movements and our uh, perforation the very tiny perforation we have created under the foam press tube and now we will Close the perforation we have created. Because it's a small perforation and it's in the middle, because we have engineered the perforation, so to speak, we are simply placing a collagen membrane to the ceiling after properly uh, lifting the Schneiderian membrane as we normally would. And then we place one piece of collagen membrane on the ceiling. And this is what we have. We proceed with the grafting as usual. And in every case, uh, I, I should say, we close the lateral window like this with a membrane and two or three pins to be safe. This is before, our bone before, our cyst. This is the after tomography. We have now, can, we can now uh, place, instead of a four millimeter implant, we can place a 12 millimeter, millimeter implant in the area. The membrane must be pinned to the, wall, to the walls if you have a larger perforation. The pinning will be done here. And in extreme cases, we can also, to create compartments, I will show you a picture of this. The membrane will be pinned from here. The membrane will go around here and will contact the medial wall, the inside wall of the sense. And we can, in uh, instances, place a pin in this wall as well. I will show you in a while. This is a larger perforation we have created while mobilizing the bone piece. It's a very thin membrane. We place a very large, quite large collagen membrane. We pin after uh, making those lines on the membrane, we pin it to the wall and after doing that, we are confident enough to place immediate implants in the same section as graphene sinus. And this is how uh, nasal collagen membranes, non-cross-linked collagen membranes behave. You place them, you pull it in place, and then you wet it, and then it will adhere to the surface. It will stick. Moving forward. This is a very close to the mesial wall perforation. This part is intact. This part is not. This is what we do. As we mentioned, cuts in the membrane, three pins, one pin inside the sinus. You don't have to put the, this pin here if you, are, uh, if you don't want to place a pin inside the sinus, but this is uh, what makes this uh, treatment safest. 
create a compartment, cre create a new Schneiderian membrane, so to speak, and then graft and finish the procedure. In our operations of the sinus lift, we carry on no matter what. The operation is finished, the uh, sinus is grafted, no matter how large the perforation is. We have a larger cyst here. We attempt to remove the cyst, and this is what we end up with, a huge perforation. This is the truly large perforation. And what we do here is placing the membrane like this, pins here, one pin here, preferably, and then we have our new lifted Schneiderian membrane and we can comfortably graft inside. We place these incisions to better adapt the membrane to the walls. And then we pin it in place. Sometimes in extreme cases, like we mentioned, we uh, suture two membranes together to make a larger blanket so that it will cover the whole inside of the sinus. This will be our new Schneiderian membrane. We graft it and we close. This is the after tomography. A huge amount of bone is created. Some residual cyst is, cyst is still there. This is eight months, two years. Still more bone than we can need. Large retention cyst. For this quickly, aspirate the contents in an in, uh, injector. We attempt to remove the cyst, but we don't. We can't remove it every time, nor do we need to. Uh, if you will enlarge the perforation to a whole new level and create a huge gap in the membrane, if you uh, become stubborn and try to remove it all. You can just leave it inside. It will have no detrimental effect as long as its contents are sufficiently aspirated. I will take questions in a while. We are coming to the end. We have pinned it in place, two pins inside, our new Schneiderian membrane, as I mentioned. We graft the place, we graft the sinus, and close it with another collagen membrane. Just two pins is enough afterwards. This is the created Schneiderian membrane, as we said. These are the pins stabilizing it from the, holding it from the outside so that it doesn't just go in all at once. That's what the pins are doing. And then we close it with another collagen membrane and phase two pins. This is the after panoramic and tomography. Sufficient foam in every location. And a quick thing to mention is when you don't remove the whole cyst, it's not a problem. This is what's left on top of the bone. It has no detrimental effects uh, to the treatment. There are a lot of st studies about sinus augmentation materials. What it comes down to is this. Xenografts and mineralized allografts are fine. These are the uh, materials of our choice. Demineralized allografts, because they are demineralized, they will resorb. Calcium sulfate, beta, beta TCP, autogenous bone as well, even though it's a gold standard material, or PRF. We uh, prefer not to use these mainly because they resorb over the six month period. You will come across studies placing, uh, citing their biomaterial of choice is basically nothing and a blood clot. And you can have success with this placing just lifting the membrane or leaving it as it is, placing the PRF or the a more um, interesting thing I have come across is they place a single screw from under the sinus to create a tent with the lifted membrane and then it fills up with foam. Remove the screw, place the implants and you're done. That's what the study says. You can have success with this, but uh, if you're beginning or if you just don't want to take a extra risk, use a xenograft or a mineralized allograft. This is what I want to leave you with before uh, creating the, mentioning a summary. Uh, I have been in our departments for four years. I have had the exceptional luck and privilege of working with uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Alper Yutekin. And 
This is my first uh, solo uninterrupted uh, lateral augmentation. It's been a while, but this is the after uh, tomography of the patient. And we have done this with a assistant who has never seen or assist, assisted anything similar to this. And the whole operation was clocked just under two hours. So I would encourage you, beginning from stock preservations and immediate implantations, uh, trying your hand and becoming comfortable with biomaterials and then uh, proceeding to sinus lifts and augmentations as you go forward. As a summary, prior to augmentations facing implants in the aesthetic region, uh, we need a dental volumetric tomography. That uh, panoramic uh, radiograph is just not enough. The right technique and biomaterial must be selected for the right case, the right tools for the right job, as we have mentioned. The aug in augmentations, primary choice is resorbable membranes, but if you need vertical bone or a lot of bone, uh, you will need grafts, autogenous bone, membrane, and pins. The membrane should be PTFP, and you should have success with it after that. Thank you for your extra time and uh, kind attention. Now I will uh, take any questions uh, you may have. Let me see. I should have the questions here. I will attempt to stop uh, sharing now. Okay, stop sharing. Okay, now it's just me. I hello, Dr. Jim. Hello, hello, hello. Okay, so okay, you hear so me now? Yeah. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, that's fine. Uh, first, I have one question from Nermeen. She's asking if there is a perforation occurring after extraction, normal extraction as a complication. How to manage? Can we use this type of membranes uh, internally in the sockets, right? That or just bone grafting? How can we deal with that? Okay, uh, very good question. The best thing to do in this uh, time is to make sure we have a perforation. How do we do this? The old and tried and tested method is holding the person, say, uh, telling the person to breathe out of his or her nose while it's open and midway through their exhale briefly hold the nose and at the moment we hold the nose we are looking at the sinus if there are either bubbles coming out or if we hear a noise coming from there at that moment we do have a perforation or we can check with a non-sharp i have to stress this non-sharp instrument to make sure if we haven't uh, created a if you don't have a perforation, not to create a perforation while checking for a perforation. And if we do have a perforation, basically, if we have um, worked with oral equipment, the face we are operating on is, uh, as far as we know, sterile. Uh, if we have, for instance, even if we have plan, uh, placed an implant in the area, the implant is sterile. So if you just wash the area with saline, Maybe if you have an antibiotic solution and then uh, fully close the flap, as we mentioned, maybe if necessary, lift a flap if you don't have one and create releasing incisions, release the flap and make sure there's an airtight close closure on the area and the sinus will not be affected in any uh, negative way. That's good. Also, I have another question regarding the dentine graft. Where I take, which teeth do you use? Is it which, which what do we use? Which teeth? Every teeth. Yeah. Any tooth. Uh, in the beginning, in their procedure, they mentioned uh, no uh, root treat, root canal, no teeth with root canal treatments. Now, yes. now they now they're saying you can use root canal treated uh, teeth. We have tried it and it works. And basically, if uh, I'm thinking of trying to think of a situation. If it has large caries, you can remove the caries and then use the tooth. Actually, I, have one of, uh, I heard about this technique. One of my colleagues is working on the using of wisdom teeth. 
uh, the lateral, you know, horizontally impacted or deeply impacted, to make yeah. sure that the yes, the the, 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 the what we can say the surrounding media is intact, uh, sterile, no care, is no root canal treatments. We don't know. We are not sure of any preapical pathosis regarding another teeth. Uh, so they are using this one and uh, the technique you described of crushing the tooth or just milling them and taking layers and then treating them with with uh, um, with saline and then putting them as a graft. They are using this technique. So I was asking that if you did use in your surgery the same way if intact teeth or you used another teeth having the same or uh, having previous problems. Uh, Connect. We usually use. As I have understood your question with uh, teeth with problems, of course. Yes. Because uh, if nothing else, they have uh, periodontal lesions, with, which is the reason we are extracting them. We are we're not extracting healthy teeth just so we can. And we can, as, I, as we mentioned, root canal carries filling as long as you remove these, except for the root, except for the gutiperk and the root canal. We can use all of these teeth, wisdom teeth, it doesn't matter. In fact, I, am, I would, uh, if I find myself on a morning talk show one day, I would tell people after having, if you have your wisdom teeth extracted, take it back, keep it with you. 30 years later, we can crush it and use, use it as a craft. Yes, yes, that's, why, that's my question, right. Uh, actually, there is a, I have another question concerning okay. that. Uh, for intraoral autograft, which place do you use the most? Is it uh, the symphysis area or the posterior area near the oblique ridge? Well, uh, if we need, this is um, also concerning the amount of bone that we need. If we need yes. a lot of bone, we make a separate incision. Uh, we prefer the posterior mandible before, uh, after the mandible, we create an incision just for this purpose before uh, beginning the main area, before placing our incision and elevating the flap in our primary area, we create an incision there, uh, collect our bone shavings with our bone scraper, and then close the area, finish with there, and then proceed to the main area. If we don't need that much bone and a little autogenous bone will be enough, we take the bone from the same area as we are with. Perhaps if we are augmenting this area, we go a little bit closer to the nose, a little bit higher up where we want the yes. bone, and then we collect bone shavings from there. So it depends on the amount of bone that we need. But our primary choice, if we if we need more, or if you're doing it for the first time, if anyone is doing it for the first time, posterior mandible is a good bet. Yes. But we we, can, we are we are sure that after you talk after you talk about uh, the resorption uh, part of the auto of autograft, you are handing that that autograft mainly fifty percent with xenograft, right? Yes, one to one ratio, yes. e equal amount. One to one. Yes, yes. Okay, I have also one question that uh, one of our friends uh, is asking about. Uh, just one second. Yes, how to store how to save the autograft safely until the patient need it. Uh, I think he is asking about the surgery. If you, but we have. Uh, if we have, we, you, you do if we the, have more, the same set, setting, either in the general anesthesia, if you are taking it from extra oral side or intra oral side in the same setting, right? Uh, we always take it from intra oral. Intra oral, yes. Uh, for all, for all, of, all of our uh, everything we have seen today has been done in a regular dental chair with. Uh, regular anesthesia, not general anesthesia. The patient is awake and with us the whole time. And uh, we always use intraoral. Intraoral, we use intraoral because it's enough. And studies, like we mentioned, show iliac bone uh, is of a lower, I don't want to say lower quality, but it, res it's te it tends to resorb faster. Actually, and I hear that. Bone has better uh, components for us to use for auto, uh, osteogenesis. Yes, I need to ask you about something as you have read that uh, if you are taking it as a graft from the same area inside the mouse, either in the mandible or the maxilla, it's something like I don't know about it, but it's, le it's related to histological effect, histological uh, appearance that the bone of this mm -hmm. area is similar somehow to this area. Either we can yes. take it from uh, the iliac crest or uh, any other external yes. side. Yes. Uh, among, from the uh, extraoral sites, uh, iliac bone is preferable. And even though it is 
preferable out of the or extra oral sites, we tend to uh, appreciate the re results we get with the intraoral bone better. Yes. Uh, another another question from uh, uh, Nermin. She says that stabilization screws for vertical augmentation. When do we remove it after six months? Or is it your protocol to remove it or just to leave it in place? Otherwise, they are inert. Uh, you should remove it because it will um, it has a very large chance of uh, interacting with, a implant, with an implant or an osteotomy if you leave it in place. So after nine months, because they are our ceiling, it is very easy to reach them. You can just basically scrape the surface a little bit and then you will see the uh, driver head and then you can remove the uh, tenting screw after nine months of full healing. Okay. Uh, actually, I need you uh, from one, one of the one of the audience has asking about uh, the case where there is a membrane exposure near the anterior area. Yes. Yes. He uh, he wants you how to, he wants to know how to manage this case to avoid this to happen. Did this happen due to over grafting when you were using, or the membrane was stiff in this area? Uh, collagen membranes are called. They are bio uh, compatible for a reason. Yes. This is their. This is the evidence of their biocompatibility. They stay for a few weeks and then they disappear, leaving the bone. And there's nothing more biocompatible than the bone itself. But when we leave a membrane there, a PTP, a tapcom membrane there for a long time, uh, the one we used in that case was a smooth membrane, so to speak, and it has a chance of happening whether if you use a PTFE membrane or a titanium mesh. I did not have a, a case of the titanium mesh usage, but the difference is titanium mesh uh, expositions do not get larger, so you don't have to remove the membrane like we did with the PTFE. If you, you have used the titanium mesh, it stays stable for a long time, so you can wait two months for exposed titanium yes. mesh. But P with PTFE, you have to remove the membrane and then wait for the bone to mature further. But if you don't have the uh, exposition in the first three months, it's not a problem. You can just remove the membrane and leave it to heal. What can we do to uh, avoid this? Now there are, uh, with uh, I think Istvan, Dr. Uh, Professor Istvan Urban's uh, Hungarian doctor's recommendation, who has written a very nice, book, nice textbook about it. Uh, there are now PTFE membranes with built-in perforations, very tiny and many perforations. These perforations allow better uh, angiogenesis through the membrane, but they don't take yes. bacteria or any detrimental effects inside, so uh, we can use that. That's what we are uh, using now if we use PTFE membranes. Perforated PTFE membranes, right? Sorry? Perforated PTFE me membranes. Yes, many built-in perforations out of the box. Yes, yes, yes. I know. I heard about this. It's just to help uh, for the adaptation of soft tissue more. I think by establishing the the blood supply through the through. I think these pores allow for the blood supply to flow through the graft. Right? Yes, because uh, uh, both to the graft and to the uh, gingiva outside, so that there's yes. not an explosion. Because at the picture I showed in the five months afterwards. You can yes. almost like this, see the membrane through the thin gingiva. It thins out and thins out because uh, its its blood supply has to come from all the way from the around the PTFE membrane. Hmm. Okay. Uh, actually, there is another question. Okay. I uh, the, this question is about the dense saccade. How do you use it, and how uh, it is the effect, um, what we can say, the effect of this uh, kit, uh, is it uh, well documented that it can help more enrich uh, sp expansion or splitting? Uh, what was the, for, what, what, what are we talking about again? Densa kit, densa, densa bears. Ah, uh, uh, okay, uh, densa bears. These are, uh, this is an osteo, this is called the osteodensification protocol. Yes. yes. What it mainly does is when the uh, usual uh, osteotomy burst cut bone away, it pushes the bone to the side continuously. It can be used to uh, have a harder wall around your osteotomy for higher primary stabilization, higher ISQ number numbers from the osteo device, or it yes. can be used to uh, 
exp for ridge expansion, but its main usage, rather than ridge expansion, is uh, creating a better wall for us in the D5 bone in our uh, xenographic sinus. Even after six months, it will be soft, and we want primary stability. So instead of a regular burr, we can just use this. Uh, now that I mention it, another basic, another main usage of this of it is this. Uh, the uh, the professor Z, uh, Ziv Mazor, as I recall his name, uh, he uses it to do closed sinus lifts. Let's say there's three millimeters of bone. We would prefer to open a lateral window. He says you can do this: go two millimeters inside, leave one millimeter with regular burrs, and then take the dance rubber, put it in reverse, slowly uh, go through the signs. And it has a non-cutting edge. And yes, yes. when you do this, when you do this motion, it will just elevate the sinus membrane and then put some grafts, elevate it in, put some graft, elevate it in, place your implants, you will have bone around your implant in the sinus. It's another use. We can say it. We will have at least short implant. We are talking about what eight to or six millimeters uh, length of the implant. Yes, yes you have yes. Three, millim three millimeters of bone. You can put you a eight, eight, to ten, eight, to eight to ten millimeters uh, embedded in bone. Yes. No, no, no. I mean about uh, using this technique of osteodensification or using the dense in this situation, this case, what you're saying. I think we are going to get about three other millimeters, maybe a total height of six millimeters. Uh, we we'll get... we can have this effect for six millimeters. Yes. Uh, basically, uh, everywhere the uh, bird touches is also densified. So, wh whatever you're doing, if you, if they have, uh, as you have seen, there are lines instead of stoppers in the bird. So, you can either say for four millimeter, millimeter implant all the way to sixteen millimeters if you need to. Okay, uh, just one minute. So I need to ask you something. Uh, one, one of the audience have said. Uh, so in, they are saying, generally talking, mm -hmm. do we go for her augmentation or this kit using Densa bears or Densa expansion kit? Okay, Densa bears are are not a miracle. Mm -hmm. They cannot uh, possibly replace. Augmentations in such in some cases, as we have seen the uh, female patient missing the congenital laterals, she has like two millimeters of bone there. You can't put those, put a dense rubber inside, make it like a bubble, and just place those one millimeters at the side and put an implant. It doesn't work like that. But for example, uh, you have just the you're on the knife edge, thinking should I. Uh, Augment or should I place an implant? In those cases, it's when you uh, use dense rubbers, you will find yourself needing less modification to the buckle side. Maybe no modification. Maybe instead of uh, creating a full augmentation, a little bit of uh, graft and a small membrane will be enough instead of a whole uh, augmentation when you use those burrs. Okay. I, another question about. Uh... Uh, once one, one one have a question that uh, I don't think which case he is asking about, but the, you say after you augmented the ridge and placed the implant, they were not in a, uh, in the anterior area. They were not palatally inclined. They were just upright. I don't think which case. I don't remember, but there was a case he is saying that in the comb beam CT picture, it was that the direction of the implant was not in a palatal bias. It just was upright. Maybe uh, we have probably just looked at the CT and said, okay, this is the direction of the bone. And in order to conserve as much bone uh, in the buccal side, we will place it in whatever angle we need, really. As long as, it's, uh, as, long as the outcome is desirable, uh, it can be in any inclination. We need less bone at the palate and more in the buccal. So yes. whatever that dictates, that's where, uh, that's how our angulation will be. It, it's, it's probably true. Okay, so just one minute. Uh, 
Uh, one uh, one has an, uh, also has another question. The case was that was uh, you shared that with combined vertical and horizontal defect. He is saying that how from where did you get this well, large width of bone? Large width of bone? Width, width, dimension, large, large uh, width, the dimension. Uh, oh, I think I know the one with um, the two. Uh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. It, it was like two rectangles. Yes, I, know, I remember. Yes, two rectangles. Yes, he is asking about this volume. Yes, uh, that was uh, one of the uh, earlier our earlier experiences with uh, vertical and combined augmentations. And uh, basically, we th we thought the more the better because if there's no such thing as too much bone, because after we place the implants, we can use an uh, osteoplasty, which we I believe have done. To, uh, because there were edges in the after we lifted the membrane, you can al always use an osteoplasty with a burr to uh, remove the excess bone. And how we did it is basically that's the miracle, so to speak, of the titanium reinforced PTFP membranes. You can create create very large amounts of bone and um, extreme heights of bone. The doctor, the professor, Istvan Urban, uh, in his textbook, he talks about creating eight to 10 millimeters of bone in the posterior maxim, posterior mandible. So uh, that's how we do it. We are using the, this technique. Uh, hmm? Yes, we are using this technique, EPTFP membrane plus uh, xenograft mainly. And uh, autograft. 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 If we are saying augmentation, it's yes. two to one autograft and xenograft. Yes. I think, uh, oh, yes, there is another one. Okay. Uh, she's saying that what's your opinion about drilling implants into RCT treated tooth with successful treatment instead of extraction tools? Uh, I don't, I don't can, get can what I have she begin, means. The beginning again? She says that what's your opinion about drilling implants into RCT treated tooth with successful treatment instead of extraction of tools? I don't well, get. She, may, maybe she's asking about a uh, socket preservation. Uh, maybe yeah. I, I, maybe if, if it's about uh, socket preservation, partial extraction, it doesn't matter if the tooth is uh, root canal. If the teeth has root canal treatment, and maybe if the, if the question is about between extraction and root canal treatments, um, it's up to the we take an endodontist's opinion. Can we save this teeth? No, we will extract an implant. If we can save this teeth and see how it goes, then we can go for a root canal. Just one second. Uh, Dr. Normini, we can, you can open the mic and talk if you have any other. Uh, place the oh, implant inside the implants. I, I, I read it. Okay. I, uh, I, I, know, I know what uh, she's talking about. It's called um, not an osteotomy, but a dentotomy. Hmm. Uh, uh, they drill osteotomies into. Uh, the tooth itself, and basically place an implant. Uh, either fully or half of it is um, contacting the bone, and half of it is uh, contacting the palatal side. Like they, it's a socket shield, but to an extreme, they remove maybe like half the palatal half of the teeth, and then uh, drill it inside. Our department has uh, annual meetings. Uh, with a few uh, thousand dentists sometimes uh, in Istanbul. Uh, one of the speakers had uh, a presentation like this, and according to their studies, it's successful, but uh, we would just rather go with our partial extraction instead of that, if we are going to conserve any tooth at all, because we know even if we just remove the whole tooth and place an immediate implant, even in the cases like you saw, the buccal bone is fully gone yes. before the extraction. We can just graft it, uh, place a membrane, and then it will heal perfectly just uh, any time. But I, I need to know how to, how, to, how does uh, osseo integration or healing happen inside the tooth? It's uh, something very uh, uh, mysterious. Uh, basically, the part of the implant that's contacting the tooth doesn't also integrate because there's no osseo to integrate. Yes. Then there's there's a tooth there, but 
uh, if I remember correctly, some of the implants, a part of the implant is contacting the bone and a large part, or maybe all of it in some cases is uh, contacting the teeth because I remember the speaker saying we are no longer doing osteotomies, we are now doing dentotomies for a while now. But we haven't uh, done a study about it. Uh, I actually, I, 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 used, I used the, uh, the partial extraction therapy technique or circuit preservation, and we are, and we are the, if we just leave a thin, a thin shell, the C-shaped shell, we just augment it with bone uh, around the implant. I, otherwise, if we are placing bilateral, so how we can drill in the, uh, the tooth, it's just somehow mysterious. I cannot really tell now, imagine. <laughs> I mean, we have, we, we have trouble uh, because of uh, some drills that, that are not sharp. I'm having trouble. I'm having trouble in the, in the anterior mandible, just trying to drill into the bone. How can I drill into the teeth? I have no idea. Yes. Uh, actually, but I have another question saying that I was asking about uh, the densakit. Is it most probably helpful in which type of bone? D2, D3? Dan uh, burs? Yes, dense burs. Yes. Weaker, uh, weaker bones. In some, cases, in some cases of like uh, anterior mandible or so, when the bone is very uh, dense and calcified and tough, and when it uh, is it, when it's just cortical bone all the way, there is nothing nothing to densify. Yes. For it to densify, it has to densify spon spongious bone. Spongious, cancellous bone. Yes. Cancellous bone or uh, a recently grafted bone is the way to go. If you try to use it in D1, you will probably not make any progress, probably. Make perforation. Maybe. Or uh, a real danger that can happen with uh, calcified bone is cracking of the yes, bone. Yes, yes, I get it. Yes, so we are talking at least that I mentioned for this technique, at least we have four millimeter widths of the ridge, right? Yes, because if you have four millimeters of uh, width, you can, like we saw, use a micro saw, splits, Place implants. While you're placing implants in four millimeters, you might as well use dense suburbs for any extra width you can get from there. But uh, four millimeters is the minimum. If we can, we would like to have either five millimeters or place it with the implants buckle side uh, exposed and then augment it with uh, some xenograft and place a membrane and create our buckle bone our, ourselves. Yes. Uh, I have another question asking about uh, the use of alloplast. You were you said it in the previous of the in the starting of the lecture, but you there were no many clinical cases in using uh, calcium biphosphate in your uh, the slides. Yes, because we uh, don't tend to use it very much because of its resorption. Uh, uh, the main idea behind the augmentation is you augment the bone and it stays there. The reason we love uh, we prefer to use xenograft is. We know it stays there 10 years, 30 years, whatever later, it will still be the same xenograft. It, it, it doesn't even, uh, sometimes as advertised, it doesn't replace with regular bone over years. It, it stays the same for decades. When the patients, uh, may God grant them long life, when they die, they will have the xenografts in the jaw. Uh, with any other material, we are very cautious. If we had to lose, use large amounts of material, like in, uh, mixing with autogen bone. When we have uh, that kind of defect and we have that kind of need for bone, we would just rather not take the risk and use xenograft, but we use the other materials. We have used them in socket preservations and grafting the buccal side of immediate implants, and we have had good results. Uh, when we can expect the material to resorb and then re be replaced with bone, but when we use xenograft, we know it will stay there. We will have something there. We will have a graft in place when we need it. Okay, I have another question asking about. Um, you talk about uh, the gross factors and this and the, the, the using of these gross factors. Uh, you mentioned BRF, but you are, didn't use it very much in the cases. Yes. Uh, so what? So it's asking about. Uh, we all know about the healing of this uh, support, but I, as I remember, it's just about. Uh, two weeks of evidence of uh, efficacy. After that, it's gone. So I think this is uh, the problem with uh, maybe with bone regeneration. It somehow not gives us, I don't remember, or I can recall it, that it does not give us the maintainability of months. So we yeah. are to try to avoid it, and we just hold the PRF, I mean in the soft tissue, right? 
Yes, uh, I have seen this question coming and I have done a tiny bit of research before coming here because I know because of that one slide, I was going to have this question. <laughs> uh, the main limitation of uh, growth factors depending on region is either the cost uh, of the material because it's an, an expensive thing to use and it is over a short effective over a short period, period of time to counteract this there they are now uh, infusing like um, gelatinous uh, sponges with growth factors and then uh, hoping to create a slow release mechanism from these uh, materials and even with that uh, if i remember correctly in uh, either one or two years ago in the osteology foundations uh, in a in a conference there was a consensus meeting and yeah. one of the subjects was this use of growth factors and the main consensus was uh there is no need to routinely use growth factors yes we can just uh, take advantage from the growth factors from the autogenous bone like we said and uh, it is sufficient the main concern is like uh, cost effectiveness uh it doesn't uh, hold over the long months we need healing and in some instances there are worries about uh, it's creating uh tumors because of the very high amount of growth in a very short period of time it can there is a worry about it leading to tumors so mm -hmm. saying it's, there's no need to use them regularly okay i have another question uh how can you manage sinus opening during extraction of upper seven i think it's a surgical question mainly it's like the first question we had yes 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 oh, you know you know to say, to, say, to say again hold the person tell, tell the patient to open their mouth and breathe from their nose and at one second midway through the breath hold the hold the nose if they are uh, if you can see uh, uh, bubbles coming from there or if you hear a noise there's a perforation and if there's a perforation because we have uh, operated with um, sterile equipment we can just rinse the area with saline once again with uh, an anti antibiotic solution if we have it and then make sure we close the area either with a raised released flap or uh, collagenous sponges and suture it to the other area and then we will have a non-problematic healing of the uh, exposed sinus during an extraction okay just another question though i have to say because the reason i uh, make this explanation to make sure to do this and check if uh, there's an uh, a real opening of the sinus is because most times we look at the panoramic radiograph or the tomography and say, oh my God, the roots are in the sinus. There is no bone there. And when I extract it, there will surely be an opening in the sinus. And most of the time when you do this test, there isn't. There is a thin layer of cortical bone, very thin, but it usually st stays there after extraction. Yes. Uh, I have another question asking about... Uh... Uh, just for a minute, when was it? Yes, controlling the palatal rolling technique. The palatal? Yes, the palatal rolling technique and soft tissue augmentation for after second stage uh, implant surgery. The, 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 the connective tissue graft. Yes, pedicle connective tissue. How, uh, how do we do it? Or No, he is asking about the, the efficacy, how to do it or just to take a connective tissue graft in a separate oh. way. Uh, you can take the connective tissue, tissue graft any way uh, you want. It was just easier for us to, if it's, uh, we were thinking if it has a pedicle, it has a better blood supply so it can Yes, uh, be yes more... I think uh, it must be an area that it's um, one of the ends of it, it did not be it not severe, right? You just take the distal one, the palatal inside and the incisal, but the mesial side, no, it's intact. So it will maintain the uh, blood supply, right? Yes, that's the reason. We want the graph to have a blood supply. You can just take a separate, from a separate place, a free uh, non-pedicle connective tissue graft and uh, graft there as well. It will 
probably be uh, just as effective because we didn't need a lot of um, volume in the soft tissue anyway. So free or pedicle, it won't make a difference. It will still be efficient. But we cannot use a PRF in this area, right? Not it not will be of no value, I think. Uh, there are studies, uh, especially like uh, tunnel procedures and so, and so on, using P using PRFs. Uh, it is just as effective. Uh, we, I, I I wouldn't consider myself uh, to have that much experience to say don't do this, do that. But what we do works, so. Instead of PRF, I would recommend, since you have opened the area and you have elevated yes. the flap, going with a connective tissue is... Uh, much easier, I possible. think. It's much easier. And the, and the same, we're, we're working at the same place. We don't need to go outside and take blood, and then we send the vision yes. and make PRF. Yes. yes. Okay, doctor. The, I think that's all of the questions I have for now. Okay. Uh, thank you for having me. Sorry for uh, using too much time. I hope uh, Professor Azar, the director, isn't mad at me for using. <laughs> no, no, we enjoyed this much, and she asked me very well to me to uh, to make sure that with this uh, webinar contains many yeah, many questions to be prepared, and I am very very happy that you were uh, le uh, letting me ask you these questions and happily to answer it. Likewise, likewise. Thank because you, the best I can and, do uh, after taking uh, too much of your time, so no, no, I'm happy to Jeff, oblige. I think it was, a, it was a very happy evening. Likewise, I, I think the same way. Thank you. Thank you very Bye. much. We are welcome. Thank you.